Hello everyone and welcome back to the Skype sessions. And today I have joining me someone who I have followed on Twitter for a very long time. She is absolutely hilarious to read day in, day out. And uh, a little while ago, she joined uh, Word on Fire, uh, Bishop Barron's organization. And just the other day, I saw her tweeting about an upcoming event. And she's going to be doing a book club. And you might have heard of the book. So I decided I have to have her on the show. And so Haley Stewart, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thanks so much for having me. Well, for those who don't follow you on Twitter and haven't done so for years, firstly, they need to follow you. Uh, but would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Who are you? What's your background? Sure. So I'm Haley. I'm married to Daniel, who makes whiskey and keeps bees and is always much cooler than I am. So I'm married <laughs> up. We've got four kids, ages, the youngest is two, the oldest is 12. And my background, I graduated from Baylor University, did their great text program. So my background is kind of a smattering of literature, philosophy, theology, and languages, but I um, kind of turned it, the program I was in allowed you to really craft your own coursework. And so I kind of focused on medieval literature was kind of what I dived into and really fell in love with. And then I started writing, started blogging, started podcasting, started doing things on the side while raising my little ones and homeschooling. And then over the past few years, that's all kind of blown up a little bit, like taken on a life of its own. So my husband and I just flip flopped roles and he's now the main homeschooling parent and I'm now the main breadwinning parent. And yeah, we're getting used to that new normal and having a lot of fun. And you mentioned your podcast. For those who don't listen to it, what is it? It's Fountains of Carrots. So I co-host it with Christy Isinger, who lives way out in Alberta, Canada. And so we're podcasting from very far away. And we have nine children between us to coordinate podcasting <laughs> sessions with. And if we're interviewing someone with lots of children... You know, sometimes there's like you know, 17 children to consider to, to record this podcast. Um, and we've been doing that for six or getting close to seven years. So Dang. we're dinosaur podcasters, but we like to <laughs> podcast about books and Catholic faith and just whatever strikes our fancy. So we've had a, a great time with it. I mentioned earlier that you recently joined Word on Fire. What are you doing there? Sure. So I'm what's called a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute. So I do some projects for them and get to collaborate with them. Just got back from Dallas, spending a few days up at their office, which is always a blast because everyone up there is just wonderful. But one of the main things I do, other than doing some writing for their blog and some filming, is I'm coordinating the Institute's book club. So within the Word on Fire Institute, they have thousands of members. One of the perks now for being a member is having access to this book club. So we're reading great things, having discussions in the forum, and then having Zoom discussions live and just um, yeah, enjoying reading interesting books with interesting people and having a great time with it. And I saw on Twitter a few days ago, you announced which book you're going to be doing next. It's one that our listeners should know very well, Till We Have Faces. What is your history with this book? Because you don't just pick Till <laughs> We Have Faces. <laughs> so I probably read it for the first time, maybe as a young teenager. I had read Chronicles of Narnia, read some of Lewis's nonfiction, but this has always been my favorite of his fiction always? by far. Um, wow. I, I mean, I love Narnia, but I think something about how well he did, how surprisingly well he did with a female protagonist mm. is just, it, it's, it's astounding to me because it's just so well done. And I've heard rumblings that his wife, Joy Davidman, did you know, help him, his experience as a husband and knowing a woman well. And also um, her input made this protagonist so um, 
so interesting and so rich. So I think that was part of it. But also, I think I love how he's highlighting themes in this classic myth. You know, he's taking the classic myth, classic mix of Cupid and Psyche. And without um, blatantly Christianizing it. Yeah, it's not on the nose. Right, no, but he is kind of highlighting these beautiful Christian themes in the story. And um, yeah, it just, it just stuck with me. And I kept rereading it every couple of years. And so in the book club, we just read a spiritual classic, Story of a Soul, by St. Therese of Lisieux, which it was my first time reading it, and it was wonderful. And we're trying to kind of mix things up with having spiritual classic, having a novel, you know, nonfiction and fiction, and mixing it up so there's something for everyone, and we're all getting a well-rounded year of reading. And this was a novel I just think would speak to a lot of people. It's Lewis. Everybody loves Lewis. And then it's not one of his, I don't think it's as popular as it should be. No, I, I, I agree. I, I tease Andrew relentlessly saying that this actually isn't his best book, uh, but I do agree. It is one of his lesser known works that would do well to be better known because it is incredible. And he does something that still to this day breaks my brain. You know, as we were going through that season, I probably read Till We Have Faces probably at least eight times over the course of the season. And I, each time I go back, I still keep seeing shades of meaning and subtle imagery that compl I completely missed the first time. But I, I am I'm really excited for you in this book club, but I'm also kind of amused because Till We Have Faces brings out reactions in people, particularly if people have been brought up on Narnia. It's like, oh, a Lewis book, The Talking Lion. Great, love it. And then they finish Till We Have Faces and it's, what the heck was that? Right, it's not quite as whimsical and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and charming. It's a little bit gritty. It's, it's, it's sad. Um, and maybe that has something to do with its pre-Christian quality. It's kind of in this fog a little bit this gloom which is you know the kingdom is called gloom and that's fitting it is a dark time they're seeing through a glass darkly mm -hmm. we had uh, dr louis marcos on the show uh, a few weeks ago and he's brought out a new book about reading the pagan classics with christian eyes so you read the stories of pandora heracles all of the others and note the the Christian themes that are in there. And it's like Lewis has taken that idea and just ratcheted it up a notch or two more so that you're never quite sure, wait, is this is this still paganism? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, there's little hints where you're going, wait, is the God of the Grey Mountain? What? No, it's not quite an allegory. Okay, but there's just little whisperings. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the things that makes it an incredibly frustrating book because we either want it to be just a pure story or a pure allegory. We don't like this in-between area where Lewis, he played a lot in Narnia, but Till We Have Faces is something different. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was an article that you put out very recently on Till We Have Faces where you linked the entire story with the Sacrament of Confession. Would you mind giving us a, an overview of what you were what you are doing. Sure. So if you've read the book, you know that it's written by the protagonist. It's kind of her confession. She's going to set down her case against the gods. And so she's writing this out and it's her autobiography in a way. And then she gets to a point where she actually gets to um encounter to really give her um to give her case to the gods to say here's here's how you wronged me and as she speaks the wrong words the words she didn't intend come out of her mouth and she has to kind of start again she has to write again and as she this experience is kind of the turning point of the book and for her as a character because it's kind of opens her eyes 
And it just, it always makes me think, if you can remember when you were a kid and you did something really dumb, but you just didn't think it through. And then you have to like give account to your parents and they go, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? And you just realize at that moment how stupid it was. But you have you have no excuse. What a dumb! I don't even know how to explain my behavior. And that's kind of the feeling that you get as she's trying to defend herself and realizes all of a sudden that she's been under this kind of veil of self deceit, and that's what has to be taken away for her to be able to really um, to it in order for her to know herself enough to be able to have any kind of meaningful encounter with the gods. I've been married a year now, and I would say that that, that feeling that you have <laughs> as a kid trying to explain to your parents why you did what you did, it's even worse when you're having to do it to a spouse. That is true. That is true. We, no, you're right. I agree. It was, it was a very bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when you're starting to try and articulate why you're bent out of shape, why you've been a bit irritable today, and you start articulating, it's like, man, I sound really stupid right now. <laughs> yes. So I, I love I love that theme. That's always been the theme that's kind of stuck with me, that we can navigate so much of our lives under this um, lack of self-knowledge, you know, not being honest with ourselves about our behavior, about who we are, about our flaws, and that it really takes something outside of ourselves to be able to put the mirror up in front of us. So for, for the protagonist and So We Have Faces, there's a really defining moment where she's meeting with the wife of her military commander who has passed away that she has kind of been in love with has he's been like kind of the closest person to her and she's overworked him in an effort to spend time with him and his wife kind of confronts her and says you kind of ate his life away you worked him to death and it's at that moment no one's been brave enough to speak to the queen because she's a queen in that way and it just um strikes her she realizes that is actually the person I am, the person who is eating the life away from other people. And it's that scene is just incredible. The way that Lewis writes it is beautiful. Hmm. And connecting this with confession, I, it was funny because I had a, a slightly different reaction as I was reading your article because I go to a Byzantine church. We do confession a little bit differently. We do it with the priest at the side and we are looking at the icon of Christ. Mm. And I started thinking about when I come to confession, I, I, I'm coming face to face with Christ. And as, as I actually, am I actually showing him my real face? Mm. I, I'm, you've been Catholic for long enough that you know that confession, where you go to confession with, uh, you might have made a couple of notes, but you then preface them with uh, the extenuating circumstances that drove me to do this, <laughs> that I did this, but I didn't really mean it, or they didn't really understand, or really, if you think about it, it's the other person's fault. Uh, but the most powerful confessions I've always had have been the ones where I have lit, I've just laid it out. Mm. I did this, it was terrible, I'm sorry. And that just makes me, like, what a powerful image to fit with Lewis's line where he's saying, how can the gods meet us face to face Till we have faces yeah. and being, you know, as, as a Catholic, you're speaking to the priest in persona Christi, but I can only imagine the power of looking at the icon of our Lord, looking him in the eyes. Um, it would be much harder to lie to yourself about, but it's I, still possible. Yeah. Believe me. <laughs> I did see a very funny TikTok the other day about a medieval peasant going to confession and saying like, well, you know, I am an Enneagram eight and this is my Myers, I feel like you need to know this father, you know, but like we all do that to a certain, you know, I've been really stressed out lately. And <laughs> Yeah, it is very hard to go to confession and not utter a single word of justification for what you're confessing. Mm -hmm. That is actually really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hmm. No, I, I really liked that that uh, that idea of to we have faces as being confession because Lewis was also a rarity, even in his time, but definitely today. Insofar as he was an Anglican who went to 
confession to a priest. And I wonder how many of those confessions that he went to, because he'd been going for a while by the time he wrote this book, I wonder how much of that was 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 formative. Because I don't think it necessarily has to be about specifically the sacrament of confession, it's just that the sacrament of confession reveals this in no uncertain terms, in its full glory, in its full colors of what we must and mustn't do when we come to God. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I love, I love the image he has of Oriole. I always think of it as Oriole. Do you pronounce it Oriole? I never I'll, I'll know. go with that. I'll go with that. <laughs> I, I, I always just blame my accent if somebody is criticizing me. It's like, oh, that's just how we do it. In I always read it one way and then I read it another way in my head. But as she, she wears a veil over her face, and the moment when Ansit, who's the wife of Bardia, her military commander, confronts her with her, her harm, the harm she's done, she takes the veil off. And I think that's such a powerful um, image of confession, too, that's kind of mirrored when she has to confront the gods, that the veils of self-deceit that we try to cover ourselves with, when you're in the confessional, and you have to actually say what you did. You have to speak the words. It there isn't a veil anymore. You know, you can't you can't cover it up. And it's such a powerful experience because I mean, I feel shame when I am having to actually speak these words, but also leaving the confessional, you get to you've spoken. The words have been spoken and you've been forgiven and you can walk out leaving that there so i'm i'm a convert so i always heard about like catholic guilt but now i'm like no like it's great you get to leave the catholic guilt of the confessional and go out in as a new person a new creation um so i love one of, go ahead one of our walls repeated complaints was that the gods didn't give her an answer um and ultimately in the trial scene she gets her answer. Uh, and in confession, we get our answer as well. It's, I forgive you, go and sin no more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even just the act of confession, it's leading, you know, Oriel, she kind of moves out of this veiled darkness to knowing herself. You do face yourself and know yourself in a really powerful way that does impact how you walk out of, you know, to start this new life. Um, having, having to look in the mirror and encounter ourselves, giving ourselves a true face and not just the veiled face we try to put over ourselves, then that really does impact how we walk out and how we live our lives. I just think it's so that self-awareness that we run from all the time because we don't want to really get down and see ourselves. That's such a key part of trying to cultivate holiness and having tied up in humility and growth and virtue and all of these things. So, yeah, I love I love the book. I keep coming back to it every every couple of years. And it's still just as powerful, especially when you get to those the trial scene and, and all of that. And, and when you when you play side by side, she looks in the mirror and she realizes, I am Ungit. Mm-hmm. But through the work of the God of love, she then sees that she becomes Psyche. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it's because the God has been reaching out to her, not her own um, personal effort that has resulted in this transformation. And I think that's key too, that we don't get to see ourselves as we are or as we could be without supernatural grace either through other people, you know, now being married, you, you know yourself better because you have this daily mirror through another person. And, but that's a grace. And then the grace of the sacraments as well. Those are, it's just, it's not something I I compared it in the piece I wrote it. It's, it's kind of like Eustace scrub trying to take the scales off himself. You know, we just aren't capable of doing that. We need that supernatural grace. Um, in order to be able to even make that confession. We, we read through The Voyage of the Dawn Treader last season, and that was my favorite book growing up, and I knew it basically off by heart. But one thing that really struck me the last time we read it 
was the fact that Eustace rolls over and exposes his belly. Mm. He, he, he opens himself to, up to be in this position of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And then Aslan starts taking his scales off. Mm, I love that. It actually it made me think of something odd. My husband has lots of tattoos and he has one on his chest of the, the Eucharistic pelican. Um, oh, okay. And he said the experience of getting it was very strange because you have the gut instinct to protect your heart and your lungs. You protect your chest. And so to let Particularly when someone's stabbing you with a needle. To let someone tattoo it felt very vulnerable um, because your whole body is saying, this isn't safe. <laughs> Protect your tor- <laughs> internal organs from this, this person attacking you. And so, I, yeah, I love, I love that image of Eustace Scrub. Eustace Claret Scrub is such a, great, such a great character. Yes, a name that he almost deserves. <laughs> Hayley, this is wonderful. Where can people go to join Word on Fire Institute, find out about the book club? What are all the information that they need sure. to Sure. So you just search Word on Fire Institute. You'll go to the main page. It'll have information about everything that's included as a member of the Institute. It's all the Word on Fire digital content, wonderful video courses. My video course is actually in progress right now. So if you want to jump in now, you can watch my liturgical living in the domestic church course. So there's just so much in there. And in the, um, if you go to groups, you just add club 451 is the name of the book club. It's a clever allusion. I didn't come up with it, but clever allusion to the temperature at which books catch fire and word on fire. So word on fire (laughs) book club. And we have getting close to 300 book club members. So um, just join us there and we'll have all the information about what's up ahead. And we're starting, we're going to begin reading till we have faces on June 15th. So we'll, we'll start and then have our Zoom discussion after a few weeks of, of reading. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. And listeners, please join us again next time. We'll go further up and further in. Cheers. <laughs>